Hello, I'm going to Detroit with almost no money and no plans, but this time bring a pair of Sarah's and a cameraman with me to experience the oldest history of the United States, pick vegetables from our urban farm, explore the abandoned factories, and take in the underground hip-hop scene, not to mention trying out some of the best hot dogs in the entire Western Hemisphere, and learning about the artistic and creative culture emerging from the economic drives, all done safely, inexpensively, and easily. Anything I can do, you can do. DIY Destinations Detroit and you are invited. We are so fortunate to live in a small world with so many cultures, so much beauty, and so much diversity. The world waits for no one. It's up to each of us to discover its magnificent destinations. I want to make travel accessible to all of us by showing how it can be done safely and inexpensively. Detroit, the largest city on the US-Canada border, with the highest population in the state of Michigan. Despite its reputation, I decided to sell it with two Sarahs to the Motor City to get the real story, and to see the wonder of this historical rich urban center. First things first, we found ourselves on cozy beds at the Hostel Detroit. The city is one and only hostel for the worried travelers. I can't say enough good things about these guys, but more about that later. After 7 hours in the car, we need to stretch our legs. And Zach, the co-owner of the hostel, knew the perfect way, a bike ride. We're slow rolling around the city, basically. It's a lot of fun, you guys are going to meet a lot of cool people. Largest regular bike ride. Um, typically 2,000 people or so show up every week. People come together, having a sense of community, riding around the city, enjoying themselves. The slow row is definitely not your average bike ride. It's a weekly event that brings together thousands of people from all walks of life to discover more about their neighborhood and each other. Where, what path are we going to? Where it changes every week. I don't even know what it is. They don't tell you until you start riding, so it's a mystery. <laughs> There's so many cool, amazing bikes out here. I kind of feel like my bike is a little boring right now. I mean, look at these bikes. And with a fist bump for good luck, we're off. I, myself, not to make sure to fall off my bike at the starting line. This event has over 12,000 registered users, and that number is growing. Many bicycle hobbyists take this opportunity to show off their flashy rides and show their price in what they represent as a community. We're not a gang. Not a gang. What's the right we, word? We are a bike club. We are leaders in our community. Definitely, definitely. As the evening settles in, more and more cyclists join us to roll into the night. Along with our countless sighting amazing deck of bikes and the interesting characters that rise them, we are also consistently reminded of ever-looming police presence. We're near the end, finally! How do you know? I heard the noises. Sign on relief. The seat is very hard. Hey, that's how you can prove you're a woman. Right, Zach? We're all men. We made it. I guess. <laughs> he said it. I trust him. Huffling and buffling our way through a snow roll called a dire need for a cold beverage, Zach once again came to our rescue as he knows a wonderful place to stake that need and to learn about one of the Detroit's homegrown sports. We're here with Chris at the Foling Warehouse. It started a couple of years ago, but I would like to hand it over to you and kind of explain what we're doing here and, you know, why, why it's Detroit's sport. There's about uh, 60 of us every year we go to the Indianapolis 500. So uh, 14 years ago, we decided we're going to build a bowling alley. We set it up and it was a total failure. Bottom line, the ball was going into our neighbors. Real bowling ball, ankle level. A couple guys were throwing the football back and forth bounced on the ground and went right into the bowling pins. They were like, we need to throw the football at the bowling pins. Yeah. That, that happened a few years and every year at Indy it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. So uh, it got to the point where, you know, like, hey, this is, You're onto this something. is something. You're onto something. There's uh, two boards, platforms, There's one football per lane and the object of the game is to knock down your opponent's 10 pins before they knock down your 10 pins. 
So uh, normally two on two, so it'd be player one, their player one, player two, their player two, repeat. There's no points, there's no frames, there's no time limit. Knock their 10 down first. You don't, you don't want to lose any beer. How it works, there's a hole in the bottom of the cup. There's a magnet that covers the hole, and the beer literally fills from the bottom. It stops all by itself. Perfect amount of head on any beer. Thank you, Chris. Thank, thank you. So why don't you go ahead and uh, give it a pull? Well, actually, we like to warn everybody because it's really loud. <whistles> we got a bug! Uh, so what's the difference between your konida because you can get them anywhere here in Detroit. What makes yours stand out and special? Well, we, we actually use a, uh, a uh, natural casing hot dog, which, is, which, which was probably something that was used in the beginning of the Coney Island uh, craze, if you may. Our hot dogs here are probably some of the best hot dogs you're going to eat for the money. We may know to give a signature hot dog a try at some point later in our visit, but we have a long day ahead of us and it was time to fill up on Oasis' legendary breakfast. My eggs are cooked perfectly in my corned beef hot. I'm so excited and so hungry. It looks delicious and let's just try it. Mmm, worth the wait. I got the banana nut pancake. I'm going to try it right now, see how it is. Thanks for stopping by today. And you heard how quiet it is over in this corner. It's because we're too busy town down. It's delicious. Either that or you're in a hurry to get out of here. Yeah, that's right. true. Well, thanks again. Okay. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Wow. I think we we'll empty up the table and uh, with the amount of food, I think all of us need to have an intensive gym quick session. feels almost tropical with all these palm trees here in the Rensen, also the headquarters for GM. 
I'm excited to see the showroom that they have, the displays of the vehicles, but also we're gonna go upstairs and check out the 360 panoramic view of the city. I'm excited, let's go. I don't mind this truck. You think it could be my Christmas bonus? Uh, I didn't bring my credit card today, but I got something better. What? I am bringing up a nice romantic view of the Detroit uh, skyline from the Renaissance Center. A group of seven interconnected buildings mark the heart of downtown Detroit. The GN Renaissance Center contains the second tallest all-hotel skyscraper in the West. The central tower stands at 73 stories, marking the tip of the antenna at 750 feet from the ground. Serving the magnificent example of modern architecture, the entire complex has been coined the city within the city. But the architectural marvel is Ransang was little soured by the fact that a tour guide of the complex was dragging on a little too long. And the Sarah's are uh, getting bored. Yeah, it just keeps going and going and going. This is why I don't like guided tours. So we're gonna go on a little adventure. The Sarah's adventure ending up leading nowhere but some empty lobbies and hallways looping back where we already tore. So it was time to move on and hit the street to see the real grip and adventure that Detroit has to offer. So we're out on Detroit's Riverwalk right now taking a stroll. Unfortunately, it is overcast and chilly, but during the summer months, people of Detroit love to take their bikes along the river, they do their jogging. We even saw yoga in the park earlier. We keep coming across these friendly by nature, the little free library where you can take a book, return a book, and um, it's a really great way to uh, be eco-friendly on the cheap. Let's see what we have today. Life, how did it get here? I don't know if it's for me, but somebody will like it. Detroit's many economic hardships has given birth to a very deep and unique artistic culture. Built in 2011 over a abandoned factory lot, the Lincoln Art Park had been a site for a number of large-scale sculptural pieces, standing as a sign of abundant creative expressions. Guys, how do I get off? Are you stuck? <laughs> Not anymore! <laughs> so they literally took any resources they had and made something beautiful from it. Anything. And to anyone else, this would be just garbage. This is amazing. It blows my mind. Something you would see at a science museum. The shape of it, the geometry, everything on point. Stuff you would learn in art school. But it was just from the creative inspiration inside them. And what did they use? Garbage. Uncle Sam right here. I want your rights. Well, Uncle Sam, you ain't gonna have our rights. We're taking it back. But it's not always glorious rebellion. Many areas have become nothing more than a shallow of memory that was once a thriving industrial zone. These places can be dangerous and we do not recommend you going alone. But we really want to explore some of these abandoned buildings to catch a glimpse of what was then a heart of the empire. Or at least to scare the living crap of each other. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> I just want to make sure your heart still works. Still works? <laughs> Detroit was once one of America's great cities. It was a boom town. But over the last 50 years, there's been a huge economic decline. 
And as a result, many parts of the city look like this. I have never been to Chernobyl, but I can only imagine something that resembles this, a ghost town. There is so much that can actually be done with these areas and properties, but seemingly no one seems to have taken over yet. <laughs> I'll get her back. I'll get her back. Just watch. Just watch. It looks as if this used to be a public market at one point. Hopefully one day with all these DIY projects happening in Detroit, they may return this to its former glory and have a farmer's market in here. I think it would be a really great idea and it goes with the spirit of Detroit from what we've seen so far. It's just like the gold rush, Detroit found a surge. <laughs> Having never fully recovered, vast era like this have been rendered but all dialect and deserted. Imagine what was once here, a blue collar worker that could make a good living, reaping the benefit of a city that was up and up. But only half century later, not only the swap of industrial buildings that are compromised, but also the surrounding neighborhoods and residences, small business, restaurants, and mom and pop shops, all lot to executive decisions and time. The high level of crime and vast expense required to rebel has left little incentive for anyone to make the use of the land. But not all hope are lost. There is a silent movement among those wishing to make the city a better place. We're on our way to the African Bead Museum and as you can see the entire building is done up with all sorts of beadwork um, and I'm excited to go in and see what is in store. So we're inside the African Bead Museum with our host Dabble who has created his artwork outside and he sells these beads to retailers and jewelry makers throughout the U.S. So there's a story behind each bead here in Double Shot. For instance, these beads are at least 800 years old. Could you tell me a little bit more how you acquired these beads? Yes, these are called eye beads and there used to be traders and dealers and one knew that I was specifically collecting African trade beads so they brought me this strand of beads and asked if I wanted to purchase it. So I jumped at the opportunity because I'd only seen these beads in books or on the internet. Here inside the African Bead Museum, you may also purchase whatever you like. I've been drawn to this one, but our host has told me it means I am married and ready to procreate. So I think I need to choose another item. The shop is only a small part of the museum. Dable took us on a tour of his property which he made into a living artwork that reflects the soul of the city. The African Beats Museum spans the entire city block with 18 exhibits on display which Dable himself created from iron, rock, wood, and mirrors. So as we walk through this exhibit, each bit tells a story. And the story we're at right now is Iron Teaching Rock's table manners. If you could elaborate a little bit more about this? Yes, table manners has to do with the culture. All your cultures determine around your eating. Iron had all the utensils so it could, you, it could eat with utensils. The rocks had to eat with their hand. Science have discovered when you eat with your hand, the minute your finger touch your lips, your saliva prepares to digest your food. What is going on here? Is it always class in session? Um, I see a we were just at the dinner table where Iron was teaching the Rock's manners. So, what's going on here? Now, this is uh, part of an exhibit. Uh, it's a three-part exhibit. But this part is dealing with, you need to be careful about what you teach yourself. You may be teaching yourself what your oppressor wants you to learn. So, you should always be aware of what, you, what you're teaching yourself. It may not be what you think it is. Exhibits like this is just the tip of the iceberg as the entire property is abundant with allegory. Having been an artist for over 45 years, Davos has used experience and wisdom to tell stories about human conditions, and he thrives to encourage community to tell their own stories. 
There are those who want to rebuild and showcase the city's robust history. And one remaining treasure that still stands to this day is Fort Paquette Avenue plant. It was a birthplace of original Model T and is the oldest automotive factory in the world accessible by the public. It has been opened as a museum to showcase the original model that Henry Ford himself built from the ground up. We decided to leave the girls to their own devices, while I catch up with Steve to talk a little bit more about the factory. Right now, we're standing inside the Paquette Avenue plant mm -hmm. as Henry Ford's very first factory. He stayed here until 1910, manufacturing cars. All of them were built one car at a time, meaning no moving assembly line. Wow. They had several different techniques. They were always trying to do it faster and more efficiently. So are these all original, like uh, the floor, the, I mean, the yes. this? So I'm yeah. actually touching the history right now, right? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, this is the, the very location where we say you can feel and touch, okay, and understand exactly what was going on more than 110 years ago. Meanwhile in the showroom, the Sarahs was taking the work on ingenious craftsmanship in this old technology very seriously. <laughs> There's no horn on this one. Uh, you call this a secret room. What's so secret about this room? Well, this room was specially set aside by Henry Ford as he was making all those early models of cars here. He took his best engineers and himself and they came here every single day. Mm -hmm. They took all the things they learned from previous cars and they were gonna put it together in this brand new vehicle. And he didn't let hardly anybody in here because uh -huh. he didn't want his competitors to see what he was up to. Okay, and we know who they are. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> we won't mention them. The many vehicles on display are a history lessons in themselves, showing the evolution of automotive's early stages, of course, including the super famous ones. Like, are we sitting on history here? Is this original? Yes, we're in a real Model T right now. This is from 1912. Uh -huh. It's called a torpedo, only because of its unique shape and it's kind of looked for the gas tank in the back. It kind of looks like a torpedo back there. Steve, can I ask you to do me a favor? Sure. Can I pour this car for a weekend? <laughs> Well, that would be kind of fun, wouldn't it? Okay? Yeah. One of the most interesting things I found about this factory is that it still uses a pulley system in order to open and shut the doors that block off each room in case there was a fire back in the day. So, let's see if I can pick up this uh, weight. Oh my god, I'm doing it. It's heavier than it looks. We're now standing in front of Henry Ford's office. It's been recreated based upon a wonderful picture that we have here of what that office looked like in 1907 here at the Paquette plant. One of the things we'd like to do is make sure that our guests understand why it is so fun and exciting to come here to Paquette. Mm -hmm. As you walk up and down these hallways right here where they were actually making cars every single day, you can actually feel it. As we walk, we can hear the oak boards, the maple boards and the oak boards actually creak underneath us. And sometimes, you know, I think I can actually hear Henry's footsteps right here inside of the cut. Have there been any like, ghost sightings around here? No, nobody's reported that to me, but I know I've heard some, some kinds of things where I wonder, what was that sound? Wow. That would be a great news if we're making a Ghost Hunter show, maybe for a future spin-off. But for now, we have our sight on getting a historical perspective on a great city that once was, and how it became what it is today. We made our way to the Detroit Historical Museum located in the Cultural Center Historical District in Midtown Detroit. This museum represents a chronicle of Detroit's historical timeline, featuring exhibits from 18th century fur and lumber trade to cobblestone streets and shops to early assembly lines. And one of my favorite parts of the museum is the candy shop. And given the fact that two Sarahs drive me insane right now, I need to sweeten them up. Hello, can someone please help me here? I was just going for a stroll along the street and I came across the drugstore. It's showcasing a lot of the medicine that would cure whatever ailments you have, but they all seem to be natural. Sarah, you need a ride? I don't need a ride. I'll do the driving. Move over. Oh man. Dramas. Oh, get going. Okay, give me a minute. I gotta spark the engine. I later call out with Joe from Detroit Historical Society to tell us a little bit more about the museum. The story behind this museum is telling over 300 years of Detroit history. Detroit is one of the oldest cities in the country. 
and has an incredibly rich history going back long before we had automobiles. Um, we, we were important for so many other things, starting with furs and into lumber and then manufacturing. Detroit has been making things for over 300 years. We talk about so many other things than just the automobile. When people think of Detroit, they think either of automobiles or Motown, and there's so much more to our music, there's so much more to our manufacturing, there's so much more to our culture that people don't know. And once they get in here, they start to understand it. What do you say the big draws to this museum is? Probably our biggest attraction is what we call the streets of old Detroit. It was a, a revolutionary idea in the 1950s, and it's been the most popular thing we've had in the museum since then. Everybody remembers it. So, Joe, can we go to a stroll in this historical street here? The streets of old Detroit is all about going for a stroll. We start our stroll in 1840, so just after Detroit has become the, the state capital of Michigan. And it's a, it's a pretty small little town, and what we do is we kind of wander then into 1870. So why don't we do that? Sure. This is when Detroit is growing as a manufacturing town, and it shows all the architecture and that kind of thing. Probably my favorite part is it shows what our streets used to be made of, which was actually old cedar logs. Wow. People don't think of that. Are these um, real? They are real, wow. absolutely. That's, so this is the way it is. This is the way Detroit was in 1870. Wow. So now we're getting into the 20th century. This is when Detroit started making automobiles and really started expanding. We've now got brick streets, we now have brick stores. In fact, we can wander right into the drugstore here. Drugstores were important in Detroit. Detroit had three of the largest pharmaceutical manufacturers in the world at the time. Really? And drugstores were a major part of where that was all going. But drugstores were also a place where people gathered and had fun at things like the soda fountain here. Really? Many of our favorite drinks, soda pops, started with people making either candies or, or making pharmaceuticals. So wait, you can have a soft drink and buy drugs in the same, same place. place. Wow, I don't know what's a regulation back then, but that's interesting. Well, there weren't any. <laughs> the Detroit Historical Museum shows that Detroit has more than just a place in industrial history, but a rich historical tapestry for opportunities and expression throughout the generation. Found its root as a main artery in a fur and logging trade to the origin of many of today's popular music genres, Detroit has a solid base of countless innovations and new ideas since its humble beginning. Going through this museum is an eye-opening experience as you can begin to realize how influenced this city has been on things that we enjoy in a modern culture. Armed with a newfound knowledge of the past, it was time to look towards the present, to a new innovation and idea that could reshape the future of Detroit. We're here at the Michigan Urban Farming Initiative and as you can see it's this beautiful huge land of just permaculture farming. How did you get the inspiration for starting something like this? Uh, so I met my co-founder Darren McCluskey in 2011 at a meeting for a student organization called the Detroit Partnership and then I ended up taking a research position with the Urban Community Oral Health Intervention Project looking at um, in a nutshell, structural inequality in the food system, um, and I got motivated to do something, and you know that sort of ended up evolving into this. Can you tell us a little about how it's helped the community in general and the relationship with the people who do come here? The work at the Michigan Urban Farming Initiative tends to fall into one of two categories. So the first is addressing structural inequality in the food system through the increased access to locally sourced organic produce, mm -hmm. the farm, right? Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of the value received by the consumer end of this, people are really happy to have access to produce that they wouldn't find at fringe retailers, which is what dominates most of Detroit. The idea is an urban agriculture farm that can serve uh, the majority of people because as we know organic high quality produce like this shouldn't be priced out to a select group of people. If someone wants to come here to Detroit, do you think they can bring this back to any city? I mean that is the idea of it. Um, we're at such a new phase in nutritional science, um, that being that the epistemology of nutritional science and healthy living is in such an infancy right now. And I mean what you see here on less than an entire city block parcel is that we can produce tens of thousands of pounds of produce per year. Um, there's no reason that this can't be 
uh, this model can't be taken by a Chicago and New York or any other city with this such capacity. We hope all the best in this project and yeah, I thanks. hope they keep expanding. Yeah, for sure. All right. Yeah. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it. Fresh mint leaves. These are going to go well with my tea tonight. co-owner of the Pink Flamingo, which serves farm-to-table meals in a communal setting weekly here in the city of Detroit. It's actually right next door to Hostel Detroit, so if you go to the hostel, come and uh, check out Mako and her gang. Uh, would you like to tell me a little bit about your business and how it came about? Sure. It's a community garden, so it's a shared space that the neighbors take care of and that everybody is welcome to. Um, we have an Airstream that's been converted into a mobile kitchen. So we cook all the food out of there and it's all sourced as locally as possible. Every Thursday evening we set up the menus different every week, um, but it focuses on really uh, local and really fresh and really health-based foods. So it sounds like uh, a lot of the dishes must be vegan or vegetarian? Sure. Um, there's always vegan and vegetarian options. Um, we keep everything gluten-free, but the focus is really to use like flavors from all around the world and to make it uh, just like a really interesting experience. So it's just another example of these community gardens and DIY projects in the city of Detroit. Exactly. Well, thank you, Mako. It was thank really you. nice to meet you. Good to meet you too. Thanks for coming. And with our mouth watering, we headed back to our hostel for Sarah to prepare a delicious vegan salad put together from 100% locally grown veggies. After filling up our stomach and preparing for the night out, it was time to get our pre-drink on. We're here in Detroit and we're still drinking Canadian beer. Just saying. We really want to check out the nightlife that Detroit has to offer, so we hop on the People Movers, Detroit's own rapid transit system that encumbered the downtown core. We stop off at Greek Town, but it has been a very chilly weeknight. There wasn't a lot going on, so we headed across the town to one of the hubs for Detroit's underground rap scene. The new Dodge Lounge hosts live events featuring some extremely talented local artists from around the city. It's a place where rappers and DJs can show off their skills, while travelers like me can get a little too lost in the music. In the freestyle show, the DJ ran into some technical difficulties with his equipment and the rapper Guilty Simpson was left without a beat. But he didn't let that stop him. In an act of quick thinking, he got some audience involved. And all the whole screen where the hustlers at Usually the pretty chick with the bubble in back Yeah, word to till the dog, I'ma get it all The combination safe behind the picture on the wall Even though mine's raised me right I swear to God raps just saved my life yeah. That's awesome how you're just like You're just doing what you love You're rapping but You had no idea that it would even get to other places in the world yeah. How does that make you feel? Ah, it makes me feel good Um and the creative process in the early stages, you just kind of uh, not really focus on where it's going. You just kind of, you know, in the element of, you know, creating music and kind of transcend uh, uh, backgrounds and cultures and, you know, kind of hit home with everybody. What would you think your most favorite place performing at is? A lot of, I can name off a gang of places. We've been uh, definitely places where I'm sure I probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to see without uh, the use of this music. You wake up in a place that you know you've never been. Uh, don't even speak the language. You know, only thing that speaks to people is the music. You know, something that you created. I think Detroit is very important to have in my music because it shows people a different side. Because Detroit doesn't always get the best press. It doesn't always get. Um, definitely doesn't get the no, press when no one no gets one hurt doesn't. or you know no one gets killed. They don't talk exactly. about that. Only when someone gets hurt, they talk about them. I think with the music, it allows me. Uh, to give people a human feel, a human vibe of somebody that's lived in Detroit, a real down-to-earth person, and uh, I think that's very important. Guys, don't forget that name, Gil Simpson. That's right. He's going to be taking over. He's going to be teaching y'all what life is about. That's right. Detroit's son. It's out right now. Piece of Stone Store Records. But there's only one taquito 
left, so we don't know what to eat. Of course he wants some noodles. Well, no, I think it's just over you up a bit. I don't want any noodles. The American Coney Island, a family-owned restaurant, a original creator of this illustrious Frankfurt, is a world famous for its frequent visit from celebrities, as shown by a huge display of photographs lining up the wall of this establishment. There got to be lots of celebrities and famous people that have walked through these doors. Can you tell us about that? Well, there's been a lot of celebrities, and we do have some of our walls that showcase some of it. And this is one of our many walls that we do. For example, Jim Caldwell, the Lions football head coach. Last year he used to come in every morning before a game and have a pony. This year he hasn't come in. Maybe one other reason why they haven't been losing every year. The Gold family, American Jewelry Loan from uh, Hardcore Pond. And we also have uh, famous reporter, Wheel of Surprise winner, Charlie LaDuff. Bumgarner, MVP, uh -huh. World know. Series from the San Francisco Giants. We got Kobayashi, famous oh. world champion eating. He actually ate four, five conies with everything on it, chili, mustard, onions, in 30 seconds. 30 which seconds? Which is quite impressive. Do you think I'll be end up in one of these walls someday? One day, as I said, we always put our champions up on the wall. I have to start training for that right away. The first few dishes that we have, obviously our signature item, which is our coney dog, which is a natural casing hot dog with our family chili recipe, it's, uh, Belgian style mustard and a sweet Vidalia onion. Mm -hmm. Then we have our chili cheese fries, Yum. which is also great food, and our euros. Well, I can't wait to try this. And the thing is, we always say about a good coney dog by how many napkins you got to use, and also mm. the natural casing, that snap that you had, mm. that's one of our signatures. Well, that is delicious. I definitely got the snap on that wiener. What's the next? Chili cheese fries. Mm -hmm. All right, one of our best things. Fries are always kind of made. Our chili, mm -hmm. as I said, it's our signature recipe. It's my grandfather's. It's the Karis chili recipe that we've been using for 98 years. I definitely have a plate of this after a night out. Not especially that. It's yeah. one of the best things. <laughs> it's a hangover cure. Right? And well, that's what it's doing. <laughs> and then we have our euro. All our product, there's no byproducts in it. Okay. Our hot dog, our chili, uh, our euros. You know, you think for a coney dog, something would be really bad for you and all this stuff, mm -hmm. but it's only 292 calories for everything on it, like chili, mustard, onions. Okay, right. time for my euro. The euro. And another big thing too, all our onions mm -hmm. are sweet Vidalia onions. They are sweet. No, it makes such a difference. It's nice and refreshing uh, with your tzatziki. Oh yeah. Mm. I know it's a lot Detroit, of food, but I'm you gotta stop come with back it. here. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much, Chris. No, thank you. Okay. It was awesome. It was finally time to see what was a fuss about. I was going to have a Coney Island of my own, and it was the moment that I fell in love. I desperately need to find out about the one who's responsible for this delicious hot dog. Could you please tell us what exactly is Coney Island and who invented it? All right, Coney Island in Detroit is a food. We eat it here. It's a family recipe. The hot dog's a special recipe for us. My grandfather invented it in 1917. It's a Greek immigrant, came over from Greece, made his way to Detroit. In fact, didn't find a job, so he started a little push cart on the same corner that we are right now that we occupy. Fast forward, 98 years later, here we still are. Wow. Going strong. Same food, same hot dog, same chili, same recipe. It's our family secret recipe. And that's my grandfather right there. That's the man. Yeah, 98 years here in Detroit, he invented the Coney Island hot dog. And here we are, like I said, we're the oldest family-owned business in the state of Michigan. The product speaks for itself, you know, that's what we're famous for. Our next stop was a Museum of Contemporary Art, an ever-changing presentation exhibit that attempt to contextualize, interpret, and educate the modern culture. Many of the exhibit will give you titles and contacts, while others are up for interpretation. Just by looking around, not all the art pieces have a description. There's two big wooden hands that are playing cat's cradle. Hands that are larger than life. This is life in between. And whatever your own hand is creating, 
is answered back by the hand of life. That's just my take on it. We call up with Mike to tell us a little bit more about MoCat's purpose. Um, we present artists that are either rising, have careers, or maybe known for something else and are presenting here, whether it's a performance, um, an event, an exhibition. Um, we always have something going on. We're able to be agile, and so this exhibition will be up until the end of the year, and then we'll have a whole new series of exhibitions. Now we're headed to the Detroit Institute of Arts. It's a beautiful building. I can't wait to see what's inside. The Detroit Institute of Art contains one of the largest collections of arts in the U.S. The entire complex spans over 650,000 square feet, displaying over 100 galleries, showing off historical collections ranging from ancient to contemporary art, and everything in between. This is um, part of the original building that was built in 1927, and it was um, an open courtyard. We now have a glass skylight on it that was put on in 1960. But originally it was a place where people would just contemplate and take a break. We have permanent furniture in here now. We have iPads installed on the library tables. People come here to study. There's a couple universities in the area. We think of this as our cultural living room. Due to renovation being done on the building, we are unable to use the main entrance on our arrival. So we are shown what most people see upon entering this massive art museum. A large hallway leading to one of Detroit's most historical significant murals. Wow, so the artwork here is, is truly amazing. Are they all from the same artists? Yes, this is um, the Diego Rivera murals. They're called Detroit Industry. And Diego Rivera was a Mexican muralist and he was a communist and this was the height of the Depression, so there was controversy. Edsel Ford, who was Henry Ford's son, actually paid for the murals. He commissioned him. So he was given pretty free reign as far as the subject matter. But the only qualification was it had to be about Detroit and about industry. And he did it pretty accurately. However, he painted his, what he considered his ideal vision. So if you see the workers, they're all ethnicities and races working together on the front line. Um, but you know, this was his vision. So what's one of the main reasons that people definitely come check this place out? Well, besides our collection, which is actually considered among the top five or six in the United States, we made it so much more visitor friendly to the non-art scholar. One reason people don't come is they think like, oh, I'm intimidated, I don't know what to think, or what if I ask a dumb question. We want to erase all of that. We have these interpretive, we call them interpretive, devices that help people access the art. We also have um, digital books, because when you display a real book that's a work of art, you can only show two pages at a time. So we digitize some of these and you can actually flip through. That really gets, gives people more access into understanding and learning bits about it. After having our fill of historical artwork, we headed out to Dearborn, a neighboring suburb of Detroit to check out the Henry Ford, a national historical landmark. What was originally began as an educational institution dedicated to Thomas Edison. In 1933, it was reopened as a museum that focused on Henry Ford's personal collection geared towards mechanical innovations. The exhibit on display includes the Automotive Hall of Fame, which include vehicles used in every era of history of the automobiles, many used by the U.S. politicians and celebrities. Also on display are concept models of future car of the past, created by brilliant minds seeking to bring on the next era of automobiles. The aviation industry also gets a huge knob in this museum, as we can see the original and replica alike from the Wright Brother Flyer, the first heavy than air power plane, to the original folklore tri-motor aircraft, the first to successfully fly the North Pole. Being a pilot and a bit of a wing nut myself, this was my favorite part of the museum. However, the Chesty locomotive is where I truly live out my dream. Finally, I get to drive a train. What are you talking about? I'm the driver. Really? What is this for then? <laughs> okay, maybe we need to take some course on being a train conductor first. This locomotive is the most powerful of its kind ever built, and one can imagine how a conductor once felt operating this impressive machine.
Now, Henry IV is not only about the past transportation modes, the museum also features artifacts that serve as a critical turning point for civil rights in the U.S. This is the bus where Rosa Parks refused to get off her seat to a white man that sparks the 1955 American Civil Rights Movement in the United States. And somehow, the bus was lost in a junkyard for many, many years. It wasn't until the early 2000s that somebody came across the bus put it up for auction where Henry Ford Museum had the funds to make the highest bid. Now it's on the showroom floor for everybody to come and enjoy a bit of this history. The best of all, there's a shuttle bus that takes you directly to a Ford factory. You'll get to see the inside manufacturing process leading to the birth of the most iconic American pickup truck, the Ford F-150. Hey, want to go and grab some burger and fries? Sure. Along there are history and arts left us starving. And our final stop was check out the fine vegetarian cuisine courtesy of Siva Detroit. Located at 66 East 4th Avenue, Siva is one of Detroit's best known vegan restaurants, notorious for many of its dishes that simulate non-vegetarian meals. I'm sitting here with Topher. Um, he is an amazing chef. I'm gonna be tasting some of the signature dishes. Mm. There you have it. So can you tell me a bit about this one? It's a gluten-free battered General Tso's cauliflower. It's got salty, it's got sweet, it's got green onions, and it's deep fried, and it is delicious. We sell more of these than anything else on our menu. I love it. I'm going to rate this a 10. Oh, wow. I'm going to do it. Okay. I'm going to do it. <laughs> That's pretty good. I'm really excited for this one. Haven't had a sandwich in a while. I'd like to add, TLT stands for Tempeh Lettuce Tomato. This is Seva's rendition of the classic BLT, Bacon Lettuce Tomato. Mm. <laughs> I think she likes it, yeah. <laughs> this is very, very good. It seems like it, it's meat, but it's not. Right. So, what is it? So that's tempeh, and that is a soy protein. It's got a sort of nutty flavor to it, yeah. and we char grill our tempeh, so it gets the smokiness of the char grill as well. We pair that with our house guacamole, with uh, lettuce and tomato, and we wrap it up with your choice of cheddar cheese, or as you have in front of you, the vegan cheese. So anybody can enjoy this sandwich. So the next dish is going to be the pad thai, which I've heard a lot of good things about, so I'm very excited to try this one. Wow. A lot of flavor, a lot of flavor happening there. We make our pad thai, here at Seva, with tofu. If, if it's a non-vegan pad thai, then we'll make it with egg. If it's a vegan pad thai, then we'll make it with double the tofu. Bean sprouts, we have scallions as a garnish, and crushed peanuts. Do you like it? I love it. Wonderful. Has a lot of goodness, a lot of nutrients in it, but completely vegan, which is amazing. I, I really can't choose my favorite because they all have their uniqueness to each one of them. So I'm just gonna give 10 stars for all of them. Thank you, Topher, for making these amazing meals. And all I gotta say is you guys gotta come check it out for yourself. Harboring a deep contempt for Sarah for tasting the food while we watch, we were invited to the kitchen and introduced the head chef at Siva. She showed us how she makes the delicious pad thai that we couldn't wait to try out, not being shy to show off her mastery in the kitchen. The wait wasn't long as it was a simple process with already prepared and delicious looking sauce. Within minutes, we were looking at our completed dish, ready to be devoured. It was time to eat and after a couple of long days we had together, things would start to get savage. Why don't you get it first? It's so unfair. I'm so, I'm so freaking hungry. What do you want? Have some manners. Use a fork. But in the end, the food at Siva was beyond our expectation and made a perfect meal for the final evening in Detroit. I almost forgot it was vegetarian.
Of all the great things we're able to experience throughout our stay, our host at Hostels Detroit got to receive the most credit. A vast number of places we visit will have otherwise been missed if it wasn't for the guidance and knowledge of Zach and Evan. And being Detroit's one and only hostel, the accommodation provided a more than a decent place to hang your hat between adventures. It was time to take our leave, so we say goodbye to our host and headed back to Canada. Regardless of its reputation, our journey through Detroit has been a unique and eye-opening experience. While the parts of inner city reflects a society that has gone through much hardship over the past decades, there has been evidence of new and progressive seeds being planted and we will relook. From the rebirth of the manufacturing sector in some aspect, it's still continuing to run the full force to this day. To young and powerful entrepreneurs try to make a difference in their communities, there's much more to be said about Detroit. That I will leave to my friends to talk about. There's a huge artist community in Detroit and th that's something you won't hear about. Everywhere you go there's art in every corner and, and drawings and paintings and huge murals. You can see there's an artist inside everyone here and I, I love that. It's very eclectic. There are so many different groups but the thing is like everybody manages to work together and a lot of the focus on Detroit has just been about community, and yes. it's just there's a uh, there's just so many groups just doing so many things, all for the betterment of the city. Every day I'd come outside, and every day I'd see somebody taking out, you know, some trash or sweeping the the, the street or hauling some wood, uh, you know, to, to to build something, and it truly is a, a like in a blank canvas and that's why I think everybody's allowed to be an artist. Also with that development, the concerns about safety have gone so low in these areas. Like Wayne State Police has a 30 or like 30 second response time or something ridiculous like that. I think lastly, you know, being a keystone in the art conversation here in Detroit, um, being able to talk about gentrification, being able to talk about the new growth in the artists and creative class here. Mm -hmm.